Hey everyone, so this week we are talking all about actually writing your own code. You're going to be taking procedures and putting your own statements in them so that whenever, say, a button is clicked or something like that, you'll actually be able to dictate for yourself what that button is actually doing rather than just having um, the textbook tell you what to do or something like that. But because we're actually talking about writing our own code and all that sort of stuff, um, we need our own planning tools, just like we had planning tools for just the application's uh, design and functionality as a whole. We actually also use planning tools for uh, individual procedures because, you know, writing procedures can be a little tricky, especially, especially if there's a lot of complicated logic going on. So we have two tools and you might remember that I briefly mentioned these names last week, uh, pseudocode and flowcharts that will allow us to plan what our procedures are actually doing and give us a good sense of where we're going when we're actually coding our application. So this video in particular is going to cover F3.1 in the textbook, uh, pseudocode and flowcharts. So let's get into it. So this is the application planning chart we saw for the first four of the five step process of designing the application and GUI. And this is a really useful tool for helping us figure out the functionality of our application. So, you know, this is the restaurant application that we were talking about last week. And we have all this picture of what's happening, such as the user is giving us a bill amount and a tip percentage. Uh, the application is actually calculating the tip based on the press of a button and all that kind of stuff. So we know what the final application will actually be doing. However, what you might have noticed is that this chart and the subsequent GUI design process that we covered last week doesn't give us everything that we need. It doesn't help us plan out everything. It just says, okay, this is what we want the application to do and to look like. And then from there, we can actually plan out where the controls go, what controls actually need to go in certain places, right? All that kind of stuff. Um, we know that there needs to be a button and a text box, uh, multiple text boxes, in fact, all that kind of stuff. But what it doesn't give us is how are we actually calculating the tip? What goes on inside of button calc underscore click that actually calculates the tip and gives that back to the user? And that's where the techniques that we're going to talk about for actually planning out procedures comes in, because that's where we say, OK, inside of button calc dot click, we need to figure out what calculations need to be made and where those calculations actually need to go in order to successfully give that information back to whatever needs it, whether it's the label or some other procedure, all that kind of stuff. So that's what we're working towards today. Now, planning procedures is going to be important for pretty much the same reasons as planning applications. You're going to be making less mistakes. You're actually going to know what you're doing ahead of time. So it's a lot easier to, you know, sort of hold on to that idea as you're trying to figure out how to implement it in code. If you know what you're doing before you start, you're not going to accidentally um, kind of get lost if, as you might if you were aimlessly working on code, uh, aimlessly putting stuff down and trying to make everything work. You might actually end up going in the wrong direction and your application might suddenly not work correctly, even though it is working and not giving you any errors and you're not exactly sure what's going on. So that whole thing can be a mess to try to get through. And of course, it also helps me because if you are having trouble with one of your procedures or with your uh, entire application in general, and you can give me all the uh, plans that you've made for each of your procedures, then that helps me cross-reference like the code against the plan and see, okay, is it maybe that the code wasn't implemented correctly or was it maybe that the plan itself had a flaw in it? 
And knowing the difference between those two can actually save a lot of time in the debugging process. So if you're able to actually plan out all of your procedures, hold on to those plans, and then give those plans to me as I'm trying to help uh, with your code, that's going to be really helpful. So super, super important. Now, I, I already mentioned the two tools at the beginning, uh, pseudocode and flowcharts. Each of those tools is going to require breaking down the procedure into steps. Uh, for example, with the uh, calculation of the tip from the restaurant application, um, you're going to break that down. So how are you going to get the uh, actual bill amount from the user? How are you going to get the tip amount from the user? You know, we can assume that they're already sitting in the text boxes, but once they are in the text boxes, how are we going to get those amounts? And then how are we going to use those amounts to actually calculate the tip? And then how are we going to display that tip back out to the user? And the idea with each of these tools is to describe each of those steps in an easy to understand way, a way that's human readable. A person can read it and understand very quickly, okay, this is what the code is doing. They don't, they don't have to worry about parsing the programming language or anything like that. In fact, they might not even need to know Visual Basic and they could still understand what your application is doing by reading through uh, the results of using one of these tools. And the idea behind this is that once we know those steps, once we have it written out in very plain to read, um, you know, steps, and we've sort of assembled it together into either pseudocode or flowcharts or whatever, it's a lot easier to transform it into code rather than having a bunch of nebulous ideas in your head and trying to get those out onto um, the code editor and maybe having to go back and change things because you realize, oh, wait, no, I didn't implement this right or something like that. So it makes your life so much easier. I can't stress enough how much easier this is going to make your life if you follow along with these uh, ways of planning out your procedures. Now, you only need to use one of these tools uh, because both essentially do the same thing, just slightly differently. And you can choose whichever one makes the most sense for you, whether, whether you prefer pseudocode or flowcharts. And you'll probably get a pretty good sense of whether you prefer pseudocode or flowcharts, maybe for um, the next programming assignment if you try out both for um, each of the procedures and see which one you like better. You'll probably figure it out pretty quickly which one you like better. So you're welcome to choose. Uh, these are tools that are meant to help you. I'm not going to require you to say, use only pseudocode or use only flowcharts for any sort of questions or anything like that. Um, unless it's like, you know, do you know how to do it maybe? But my, my plan isn't to say everyone should do this or everyone should do that. These are tools that are meant to help you. And because of that, you should use them however you want to, but you should use them. So as long as you're using at least one of them, uh, I'm happy. And hopefully as long as you're using at least one of them, you'll understand why it's so important to use them. I talked about this a bit last week, but a lot of this is from my own uh, life's regrets of not using nearly enough pseudocode or flowcharts or anything like that. And the amount of time that I wasted and the amount of hours I spent up way too late at night trying to fix programs right before a deadline or something like that, um, that all could have been avoided if I had just tried to plan ahead of time using pseudocode or flowcharts or something. So I urge you to learn from my mistakes and plan out your applications, both using the planning charts and either pseudocode or flowcharts. All right, so here is the example application for this uh, video. We're going to be talking about an application that takes in the radius of a circle, the user actually types that in, and then it 
uh, gives the user back the area of that circle. It, uh, the user types in the radius inside of a text box, and then they can press a calculate button, and that calculate button will run button calc underscore click, that whole procedure, wherein the area of the circle will be calculated and then displayed back out to the user using label area. And of course, there's an exit button. So the idea here, you know, we have all the functionality, we have all of the um, components of the GUI that are needed, the text box, the buttons, and the label. And we also have, um, you know, what each of those components are kind of doing, and then it's all assembled in the GUI. But now our job is to plan out how the area is going to be calculated and displayed based on input from the user. So that's what we're going to show through both pseudocode and um, flowcharts. Let's get into it. Pseudocode is super easy. It is probably what we all wish programming actually was, is that we, rather than just writing out statements in code or something like that, we write each step of the procedure out in human readable language as if we were instructing another person. Um, the idea here is to use short statements. So you want to keep each step pretty much as short as possible, rather than saying something like, get the user input radius and then calculate the area using pi r squared or something like that. You would, that would sort of be combining two steps at once, right? So you would be directing uh, that the procedure will first, in one step, get the, um, get the radius that the user input from the text box. And then in the next step, you would say, calculate the area using pi r squared or something like that. We get into a little more detail and I'll show you what I mean by that on the uh, next slide where I actually show off some pseudocode. But that's the idea is that we break everything down. We take it one step at a time and we use short, simple statements that can't really be broken down much further. Uh, and it's human readable. Then the nice thing about it being human readable is that we can immediately see, okay, is there a flaw in the logic? Am I missing something? Anything like that? It's a lot easier for us to see it when it's a human readable sentence uh, written in our uh, human language of choice. It's a lot easier to um, recognize when there's flaws in the logic or something like that, when it's easy for us to read. And it's also easy to, you know, have a second pair of eyes on it by showing it to someone else and say, hey, does this sound right? And they can look and say, oh, well, you're missing something right here or something like that. Um, when you're able to just write everything down really simply like that, you can do a lot of possible debugging ahead of time by just making sure that the process is right, that all of the steps are right and that you're not missing anything. Because if you just try to start writing code immediately, it might not be so obvious since code is a little harder to read, um, especially once you're still learning how to code, it's a little harder to read. So then you might miss things. Um, so because of that, uh, readable pseudocode is fantastic. All right, so what I have here are the two uh, procedures that we're really concerned about inside of the circle area uh, program. And we're going to look at the pseudocode for both of them. Now, one of these is gonna be really easy. Button exit underscore click is gonna be super easy because for every single application that you write that has an exit button, it's going to be exactly the same. So, you know, we'll get to that. But the really interesting one is button calc underscore click. Let's uh, get into what that looks like. Now, 99% of the time, the other 1% usually being 
cases like button exit underscore click, but 99% of the time, your first step in pseudocode is going to be declaring variables. Now we're going to talk a lot more about variables in the next like in the next video, but you can essentially think of variables as containers for values. We uh, can take a value and put it inside of that container and that container will have a name associated with it. And when we tell Visual Basic to access the value in the container with that particular name, Visual Basic is able to sort of look on the shelves of all the variable containers that it has and we'll find the container with the right name and open it up and take a look at that value and use it, you know, however you want to use it. But variables are things that contain values. And they're really important when we're working in procedures because when we're taking in values from outside of our procedure, such as from a text box or something, we can take that value and put it into one of our variable containers and hold it safe. And, you know, Visual Basic will keep it safe and let us use it within our procedure. And then once we actually have it inside of our procedure, we're able to use it in whatever calculations we want. We can also, when we're doing some sort of calculations, and we actually talked more about calculations uh, in another video this week as well. So stay tuned for that. But when we talk, uh, when we're, uh, doing calculations and we want to hold onto values for the calculations that we're doing, we can also use another variable container to hold onto those values, which is great because if we're doing some really, really, really complex calculations and there's 26 steps in order to actually do this whole calculation, rather than trying to cram everything into one ugly, hard to debug and hard to understand equation, we can just break it up into 26 smaller equations, 26 smaller steps, and stick all of those intermediary values into their own variables. So like I said, we'll talk more about variables in the next video, but that's the idea. So in Visual Basic, what we have to do at the top of our procedure is tell Visual Basic what variables we will be using inside of that procedure. But the problem is, how do we know what variables we're actually going to be using if we, um, you know, haven't actually written out the pseudocode yet? That's why I have these red boxes here. Step one, I'm going to leave space to declare all the variables that we need, but I'm not going to actually write out what those variables are yet. And we'll actually write in those variables, we'll fill in those blanks as we continue on through the pseudocode and recognize, oh, well, here's a variable that we need. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about my logic for why I'm doing it this way in a little bit, but that's the idea, is that I leave some room at the top of my pseudocode to list out the variables that I'm going to declare ahead of time. And then, starting with step two, I actually start writing out the steps of this project. All right, well, the next step is to actually obtain the radius value from the user, from the text box that they, uh, you know, actually filled out the radius into. We're just going to worry about getting it from that text box and putting it inside of a container within our own procedure so that it's a lot easier for us to use that value. It's easier for us to use that value if it's contained inside of our own procedure than it is for us to constantly have to uh, go into textradius.text .text and get that value from there. Most of the reason why is because a text box, when a user types a number into a text box, it's not actually stored as a number just yet. And we talk about that more in a couple videos uh, in the try parse 
video specifically, but the short reason why is because um, there's no guarantee that the user actually typed in a number. So if the user didn't type in a number, the uh, computer doesn't want to automatically assume that, you know, there is a number in there and they don't automatically want to try to convert it to a number because it might uh, erroneously lead to some loss of information or something like that. It, it's a little complicated. Uh, we talk about all these topics later on. Uh, and unfortunately, the nature of the way we're presenting this, it's a little bit nonlinear. But regardless, it's stored as a string. And I mentioned this, uh, I believe, in week one, or in chapter one. It's stored as a string, which is really just a whole bunch of letters uh, and spaces and numbers or whatever. It's like all, all the um, symbols that we use to type stuff out with and all that kind of stuff just kind of stored as a thing. Maybe it's a sentence, maybe it's a word, maybe it's a whole sequence of numbers and letters and all that kind of stuff, but it, it's just stored as like a string which tells Visual Basic, hey, this is just text. Um, we're not going to assume it's a number. We're not going to assume it's like anything else. It, it, it's just text that someone has entered um, or that we are displaying or whatever. Just leave it as text. So it's left as text. Every time we want to uh, get that text and convert it to a number, uh, we actually have to run a conversion process. And if we just, if we didn't store it, if we just kept on accessing it from textradius.txt, we'd have to convert it every single time. But what we can do using these cool variable things is we can convert it to a number one time, store that number into a variable, and then we always have access to the numerical version of that um, value. And we never have to worry about text radius.txt again. We never have to worry about the conversion again because we have the number inside of one of our variables. So that's the idea right here is in step two, we are just worrying about that conversion and storing it in double radius. Now I know that the semicolon does make it look a little bit like two steps, but it actually does count as one because if we don't store it right away, if we just converted it in one step, we would lose that value forever. So we do actually have to store it. Um, so yeah, that's the second step. We are getting whatever the user input that we need, and then we are converting that into a number and storing that. And likely if you are writing an application that is using information from a user, you will be doing that as your steps to through whatever. Immediately after declaring your variables, you'll start taking in the input from the user and converting it to the right type or doing whatever you need to with that input in order to make it usable for your procedure. Now, right here, you'll notice that I've said store in double radius. This is actually a variable name. And in the next video, we talk about variable names. We'll talk about why I put double right here, but essentially this is a, you know, how we have like button, uh, you know, the, the button right here in front of button calc and button exit, or we have label or we have text to refer to like labels and text boxes and all that kind of stuff. This double works the same way. It refers to a double, which is a type of number and more on that in the next video. But essentially this uh, double is a number with a decimal point. So we see double radius. It is the name of a variable. It refers to a variable that contains a double, a number with a decimal point, and it holds the radius of the circle. So naming conventions are very similar and we'll talk more about that next video. But all of that said, what we have here is our first use of a variable, which means that now we know that we have to declare at least one variable, we can write that up here in our first step. So now we say declare the double radius variable, possibly more. I mean, you can see another red box there, but 
you know, you don't want to necessarily assume that you have all of your variables that you need until you're done writing out your pseudocode. So now we have the radius stored, we can actually calculate the area. And we'll do that by multiplying pi, you know, 3.14159, et cetera, et cetera. We'll multiply pi by double radius squared, pi r squared. And then we store the result of that in another variable, double area right here, which means, hey, we figured out our other variable. So now we are declaring two variables at the very top, double radius and double area. Now, something that might be a little interesting is I've just said this pi thing right here, but it's not actually um, specified fully. And I, I kind of did do that a little bit on purpose because, uh, you know, some of the reasons why I, I don't want to um, say exactly how I'm implementing pi. All of that kind of stuff will come later in the series of videos. And there's a lot of information we need to get through in order to really get to how I'm talking about implementing pi. But the idea is that uh, we will use the value, you know, 3.14159, 265, you know, to whatever precision that we want to, but we'll, we'll use some value of pi. And at this point, with the knowledge we have right now, that would just mean writing in 3.14159265, whatever, into the actual code, uh, just typing the number out to however far we want to define it. And Honestly, in the pseudocode, you probably actually should say what value you're using for pi. And the textbook actually does that. We'll look at what the textbook's version of the pseudocode looks like in just a minute. But you should say how far you, how precise you want to define pi like this, you know, any, any sort of constant you're using. It's good practice because you know ahead of time how precise the values are going to be and all that kind of stuff before you're actually going and... Uh, doing any sort of calculations. But we'll talk about my preferred way of handling multiplying by some kind of constant like this in a future video. And then the last step of button calc underscore click is to actually uh, give the user the uh, value that you've calculated. And we'll just say, you know, display double area in label area. Um, you could also say uh, set the value that's or put the value inside of double area, uh, convert that to a string and save that in the label area dot text property or something like that. The you know we'll actually in this chapter talk about the mechanisms by which you have to do that. But you know the last step is you can just say display double area in label area. And that is understandable enough for a person to say, okay, well, we're just giving it back to the user, but also gives you enough detail to know what you have to do. At least by the end of this chapter, you'll know what you have to do in order to actually display that value for the user. Now, button exit underscore click is super, super easy because it only has one purpose, and that is to end the application. And that's all you have to put down for your pseudocode for any exit button that you have. You just end the application. That's one step. And if you remember the code for that, all you have to do there is just write me.close. So button exit underscore click, super easy pseudocode. Now here's a side-by-side -side comparison of my pseudocode that I wrote and the pseudocode uh, that the textbook wrote, both for the button calc underscore click um, fu procedure, function, whatever word you want to use for it. And I want you to pause the video, take a moment to compare the two, see what you like in mine, see what you like in the textbooks, because, you know, there's no one right way necessarily of doing pseudocode in this style. Um, 
there's a lot of different styles of pseudocode depending on what you're trying to do with it whether you're trying to implement a uh, procedure like this there's like academic pseudocode for sharing algorithmic research and all that kind of stuff um there's people will just even write out uh descriptions of what they're doing and sort of sentence form which is okay but personally i do like the step-by-step -step form because it gives you a much cleaner translation to code uh, regardless like there's no one right way to do pseudocode you don't have to say the exact names of the variables that you're declaring you know you don't have to write it write it down like i have i personally find it helpful because it helps me remember oh these are all the variables that i'm using and it makes sure that i helps me make sure that i remember to actually declare every single one rather than having to hunt through the flow the, the pseudocode and pick out all the variables i have to declare or something like that uh you might like how the textbook does it where they just don't really worry about it so much and maybe you write a separate list of variables and they're what they're actually holding on the side or maybe you don't even do that at all and you just do the declarations as you're going through implementing everything but it it's all about what works best for you i personally you know i, I said that maybe it's better to put what values you're using for pi inside of the pseudocode but the style that i make stuff Maybe I wouldn't put it there. I might have it put elsewhere in my planning for my application, especially if multiple um, procedures are using pi for whatever reason. Like if we had a procedure that calculated the area and a procedure that calculated the circumference or something like that, right? Um, if I put that they're both using pi and separately defined what pi was, pi having some kind of constant value that both of them are able to use, then that might work better for me. And that's actually personally how I thought about it when I was writing the pseudocode. So you get to choose how you're doing this as you're learning how to write pseudocode and as you're learning how to program. You don't have to just do what I'm doing or just do what the textbook is doing or what anyone is doing just as long as it works for you and as long as it's writing those individual steps out in a human readable form that's probably what's most important about pseudocode right here now flowcharts are extremely similar to pseudocode because you're breaking up your procedure into individual steps uh, and using somewhat human readable words to actually describe what those steps are doing but they also visually show how each step flows into each other and they use standardized symbols in order to show what each step really is doing. It like further emphasizes the purpose of each step visually. So the use of shape and relative positioning and all that kind of stuff gives information about what each step is doing. All right, so this is an example of a flowchart. There's this idea of all of the steps in the procedure flowing into each other from the start to declaring the variables, to converting the property and storing in double radius, etc., etc. And you can probably see a lot of the similarities between a flowchart and a pseudocode representation of our solution. Um, the biggest difference being this more visual element, the shapes of all of these different steps and how they flow into each other. We have start and stop symbols, which are really important to, you know, help specify where exactly the procedure actually starts and stops, where it begins and where it ends. And that might not seem super important now, but as procedures get more and more complicated, start and stop symbols are actually really helpful because flowcharts can start to get very complicated and messy and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, they're good to include. We have the process symbols. That's essentially any time where we are doing some 
sort of calculation or, uh, you know, grabbing values that the user input and converting them, you know, storing them in variables, any of that kind of stuff, any just like taking data, you know, converting it, moving it around, all that kind of stuff. And then we have an input output symbol, the red trapezoid, as opposed to the um, orange rectangle of the process symbols or the blue rounded rectangles of the search stop symbols. But input output is anytime we actually directly take something in from the user or give something back to the user. So displaying the area in label area would be output. You know, we are outputting data to the user. Uh, grabbing the user input from text radius.text doesn't actually count as input because, you know, the user has already done that well before uh, they click the calculate button and we start running our procedure. If we were directly asking the user for input in this procedure after they clicked the button as part of our calculations and all that, that would count as input and that's where we would use the red trapezoid. But because they already gave their input to the text box a long time ago before they actually clicked the calculate button and started our procedure, because of all that, you know, we don't have to worry about marking this um, converting text radius dot text property as input output, even though we're dealing with data that the user gave us. So we don't got to worry about that here. Uh, in this case, the only place where we are giving output to the user is displaying the area in label area, because that's the point where we are directly communicating information to the user. And the flow lines themselves are these black lines that show the flow of the procedure from step to step. So start flows into declaring the variables, which flows into converting the con the contain uh, the contents of um, text radius dot text into a number and storing in double radius, which flows into calculating the area and so on and so forth. That flow shows the, um, you know, how all the steps flow into each other in order to actually uh, complete everything. And here is the flow chart for button exit underscore click. Super easy. You start, you end the application, and you stop the procedure. And you'll probably see this one a lot in all of your applications if you are using flowcharts like this. All right, so that is pseudocode and flowcharts. Those are really important tools to keep in your uh, toolbox of techniques for coding and all that kind of stuff. You should use at least one of pseudocode and flowcharts in order to plan out your procedures for the reasons I explained above. Now, I know that I touched upon a lot of concepts that we haven't covered in this class yet, and that's totally fine. Um, we will be actually talking about everything that you probably are a little bit confused about, like variables and stuff, in the upcoming videos. So uh, look forward to all that, and maybe once we have talked about all of those concepts, you can go back to your notes or go back to this video and look at the pseudocode and the flowcharts and with a new understanding of all the material and see if that all makes sense for you. So see you all in the next video where we talk about memory and variables.